Can you beat Pokemon Crystal if you start in Kanto? The gym leaders of Gen 2's Kanto are notoriously weak, since their post-game content Pokemon are lower than the Elite Four. But I always thought that at level 40, they would pose a massive threat to a beginner trainer. So could you beat them if you started your journey there? And would it be possible to even beat the game, all with no wild Pokemon grinding? Let's take this level 5 Bulbasaur and give it a shot. The first gym leader we'll face is Brock, and he is not rocking level 10s like he does in Red and Blue. Oh no, he has 5 Pokemon, including a level 44 Onix as his ace. Even with every Pokemon on his team having a 4x grass weakness, a level 5 Bulbasaur isn't going to do anything for this fight. So we're going to need to come up with a very good strategy. Since, as I stated, there will be no grinding. Grinding is cringe, so the only way we can get experience in this game is through battling trainers. Now, Gen 2 Kanto is a very interesting place. The levels of the wild Pokemon of the region are mapped to the same levels as they were in Generation 1. Unfortunately, however, all the trainers are not, which I found out the hard way as I approached our first trainer on Route 1. This girl settled a level 38 Ivysaur that proceeded to whip me into the Dirt. Now, so on attempt number two, I decided to avoid all the trainers, pass right through Viridian City, and arrive safely in Pewter, home of the Brockinator. So at this point in the run, I didn't have a plan. Because it's got one-to-one -one mapping, all the wild Pokemon in this area were just as weak as my Bulbasaur, so they weren't going to be of any use. I did have one idea, however. I thought that since there's no NPC blocking your path to Mount Moon like in Gen 1, maybe we could make it to Cerulean before even fighting Brock. From there we could head south and maybe catch a stronger Pokemon near another city. But this NPC that I accidentally made eye contact with had other plants. Yeah, uh, that's gonna be wipe number two. Now, when you wipe in this game, you do lose money, and that is not great, but I'm someone who likes, uh consequences. So it's at this point I also decided to make things a little more interesting with a wager for you guys. Every time I wipe out, I'll give away a copy of Scarlet and Violet to a subscriber that watches this video to the end. I'm actually probably going to lose a lot of money on this. Anyway, it turns out that all the NPCs on this route are avoidable, so I did manage to make it to Mount Moon entrance. But as soon as I walked in, some dude with red hair named question mark question mark question mark decided he wanted to fight me. I don't know, he seemed to know me. That I, I I think he had the wrong guy because I'm just a simple kid from Kanto. I don't know anything about no Johto. Anyway, um, he 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 beat me r really bad. And in foiling my plan, I now hate him with the fire of a thousand burning suns, and he is my sworn nemesis. So anyway, Mount Moon was a no-go, and now we have to find another way to escape this early game hellscape. But one other alteration I made to this run is that I started with all the HMs. Yeah, you can't actually get them in Gen 2 Kanto, so the run would be impossible otherwise. Now, having had Surf in my back pocket, one idea that I was holding onto was maybe heading south of Palatown to catch a strong water type. But since I had stupidly gone with Bulbasaur, I didn't think I had a Surf Pokemon. You know, since everything that's available in Gen 1 before Brock is like Pidgeys, Rattatas, and, and Bugs, right? Well, it turns out that while the leveling is the same, the actual wild Pokemon differ, and you can catch a Sandrit on the very first route that learns Surf. So with no other clear options, that's exactly what we did. Taught it Surf, put one foot on its belly, one foot on its face, and we took off together from the shoreline. And as my little man Sentrit was backstroking further and further from the shore, a level 39 Tentacool decided to fight us. With wipe number four inbound, an inability to run, my only point of recourse was to catch it. So I threw a Pokeball and it actually worked. Yeah, it turns out that catching like high level wild Pokemon is not that crazy. But regardless, I was thrilled and in my surprise, I named this guy LOL. Anyway, from here, I immediately took this Tentacool up against some of the weaker bug catchers of Route 2. It was then able to evolve into Tentacruel and all of the sudden, it's looking like we actually have a shot against Brock and maybe even beating the game. Now, just before we get into this fight, I will give you the rest of the rules for this challenge. The first is I'm not going to allow myself to use HMs within battle until I get their corresponding gym badge number. Mainly because Surf is overpowered and the purpose of getting HMs is only to make the map accessible. The second rule is I can only catch one Pokemon per route and I'm not allowed to use duplicate Pokemon. That way I can't just stack up on Tentacruel 
for this fight. Also, I can't use items in battle, we'll be playing all major fights under set mode rules, and I have to beat the gyms in order. So, Brock is up, and just like we do in Gen 1, I lead with Bulbasaur. But from here, the fight takes a very different turn. I switch to Sentret for a free swap in onto my Tentacruel. He chooses Rollout, but it doesn't really matter because I 4 times super effective one-shot him and Bulbasaur gets some juicy experience. Rhyhorn is out next and goes down in one shot as well. But now it's into the hard stuff because Omastar is Water Rock, so it's only neutral to water moves. It starts by hitting a Spike Cannon as I defend with Barrier that raises my defense by two stages. I then go for a Barrage of Bubble Beans as it lands Surf's taking me into the orange before I can go down. And at this point he sends out Kabutops, which puts us in a very tricky spot. I've got Barrier up, so Slash isn't gonna do a lot of damage. But this move has a higher chance to crit, and if it were to do so, it would ignore all my defensive stat boosts and do double damage resulting in a loss. So as I continue my beaming of bubbles, the moment of truth reveals itself as I in fact land a crit, it does not, and then I'm able to take it out. From here, all that's left is his trusty Onix. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, the Pokemon with less attack than Caterpie. And as per usual fashion, it goes down in one shot. And with that, we claim our first batch. All in all, I would say it was a favorable fight for us, but not completely RNG dependent. The lucky crit was not necessary to win, we just would have had to risk another slash from Kabutops. But in the end, it all worked out. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the long, long, long journey to Misty. So feeling confident with her first dub, I head east to battle the trainers along Route 3 for experience. Bulbasaur manages to evolve, and I decide to try and fight my nemesis again. With the Tentacruel, Sneasel goes down easy, but it turns out he has a level 43 Alakazam and a 42 Magneton, which makes this nearly impossible as they're both super effective against Tentacruel. So loss number four, and I decide we need to try to find another way. Now, me being stupid, I also realize we have the power of cut. And with cut, we do have one other option. We could cut this tree right here and go through Diglett's cave. <laughs> Except as soon as I popped out onto the other side, there's that pesky Snorlax blocking me. I can walk on top of it, but I can't walk past it. So this is all also off the table. One positive note though is I was able to catch a level 32 Diglett here that we named General. And yeah, that is a little bit of foreshadowing for a future fight. Anyway, from here I was thinking maybe we could get some levels into Diglett. You know, it's pretty fast. It's got that four times weakness of Magneton. Maybe we could beat our rival. So I'm traveling through the ocean routes around Seafoam Islands. And as I reach the end of that last route, I come to what I assumed was the Fuchsia City blockade to see it's now gone. Something I did see to have unlocked it. My suspicion is that it had something to do with beating Brock, but either way, this is great because now I don't have to fight a level 43 Alakazam that outspeeds my entire team. So we make it to Fuchsia City, but from here it's not totally over, as we still need to slog through many routes to take us to Lavender Town. I avoid all the trainers we can, we make it to Lavender Town, and since this is a Kanto playthrough, I elect to go through Rock Tunnel, since that's the way you get to Lavender Town in the original games. Now one note I had is that Rock Tunnel is just really Really weird in this generation. It's been remodeled, but it's just empty. There's nothing here. There's no trainers. There's a few items. It's it's really sad, actually. And through this long journey, the other thing you may have been wondering is whether I've been catching any super strong Pokemon. The answer is sadly no. The level scaling is exactly the same as in Gen 1. And I'm realizing that the water route we were just on might have the strongest Pokemon we can catch in the entire region. So although we did manage to get in some nice training for Ivysaur, the team isn't looking misty ready as we walk into Cerulean City. Now, Gen 2's got its own interesting thing going on for Misty. We walk into the gym, there's an encounter with a Team Rocket member with a machine part, and from here we head north to take on the Bootleg Nugget Bridge, which is more of a nugget field in the game that is composed of eight trainers in total through this field and not the bridge that you would have done in Generation 1. Anyway, we put the beat down in them, encounter Misty's dates, and lastly, I make sure to grab the Berserk Gene, located just outside of where Mewtwo's cave would have been in this game. And while Mewtwo isn't here, this item will help us win one of the most challenging fights of this entire run. Now with that section taken care of, we head to the gym with a now Venusaur ready to take on Misty. And this is another really hard fight. I lead Venusaur while she goes with a Golduck that knows Psychic. I know what you're thinking, bad play, but I have to do this. Fortunately for us, an 
Unfortunately for Golduck, it is not a Psychic type, so it doesn't have stat bonus and it's unable to kill us in one shot. We're able to land a Sleep and get a small heal with our Berry. Sleep doesn't last long, however, and Psychic is able to knock us down to 3 HP before we're able to take it out. Quagsire comes out next, and since it's really slow, is an easy one shot. But from here, this is where things get really tricky, because Lapras is out next and it knows Blizzard. So I sack our loving Sentret and I swap into Doug Trio. I outspeed Lapras and my plan is to hit it with sand attacks. I know what you're thinking. Really? You're gonna go for cheese strats, Patrick, are you? But I, I don't. Listen, I assure you, it's more strategic than that because Lapras only has five PP on its blizzard. So I spam sand attack as it misses two blizzards before taking me down. From here, I'm able to stall it with my other weak Pokemon before blizzards PP is no more. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, the difference between cheesing and high level 999 IQ Pokemon PP stalls is sometimes just framing. Anyway, now it's time for the moment of truth because at this point, we're basically down to our RNG. Venusaur comes out with 3 HP, and while it does outspeed, it needs to hit this sleep powder. In a moment of absolute majesty, King Venusaur hits it and is able to get off a Leech Seed next turn to start healing. And Lapras can't do much even once it's awake because it doesn't have Blizzard. From here, it's just a few simple Razor Leafs and we're able to take Lapras down. So last up is Starmie, and this is a little tricky. Going into this fight, I equipped a Bitterberry that I got from Route 1 on Tentacruel. It confuses us to waste a turn, and at this point, the fight basically becomes a battle of attrition. Starmie doesn't actually have Psychic, so it can't do anything to majorly hurt me, but I have Acid, and it's a long and slow five hit kill to take it down. Unfortunately, Starmie knows Recover. So overall, I'm doing more damage per turn, but I can't kill it because it keeps healing. And this part is where RNG takes hold. It comes down to whether we can get the 10% Acid roll to lower Starmie's defense. Yet here, we're basically stuck grinding back and forth as I pray for a defense drop, but it just keeps recovering. In the end though, it never comes, but we get even luckier and I get a crit to finish the fight. So while I wish I could say that that was first try, uh, what you saw was actually fight number three. There was, in fairness, a lot of lucky rolls required for this fight, and honestly, I'm just happy we managed to do it that quickly. So this run is kind of weird because these are two of the higher level gym leaders and they're out of the way. So things are about to get much faster. From Cerulean, we can go straight to Lieutenant Surge, who is a much easier fight thanks to Doug Trio. The general takes the main stage and is able to take out three of his Pokemon until Electabuzz comes out. From here, Venusaur is able to do Leech Seed Sleep Strats to take it down, and then on his last Pokemon, knowing he's backed into a corner, Surge decides to use Explosion on General to go down in a blaze of glory. Look, he can call himself what he wants, but from that performance, I think it's safe to say that Doug Trio is the top military leader of Kanto. Badge number three secured, Grass is up next. From here, I'm thinking, great, this is gonna be easy. We'll go get ourselves a Hound Hour, since that's a Gen 2 Kanto exclusive that I'd normally never get to use. And just as the game feels like it's getting easier, I come to our next roadblock. Hound Hour is caught at level 18. And after doing some quick math, I realized there's not very much XP left in the region. See, I was thinking that the trainers would all be stronger than the opening one rote lady with a level 38 Pokemon, but it turns out since the game is ordered different in Gen 2, Pallet Town is one of the last towns you make it to. And so because of that, it's also got some of the highest level trainers. Pretty much everything else in Kanto is between level 28 and 32. So if we want to be able to take on Blue and even the Elite Four, I'm realizing we need to be catching Pokemon that are as high a level as possible. This challenge is slowly becoming a maximization of XP. Level 50 Dragon Knights, Blue's got 50 plus. How are we gonna be able to do this? Do this, do this, do this. But then it hit me. What if instead of getting more XP, we just made the XP we get go further? There are a type of Pokemon that gain XP at a higher rate after. So with that thought in mind, I headed to Route 14 and started running around aimlessly. It took me a while to get, but we were able to come across a Chansey, which has a 1% chance to spawn. Now, if you're thinking about the Lucky Egg, that's not what we're doing. The Lucky Egg has a 2% chance to spawn on all 1% chances. That would take us years. But one thing of very high interest is in Kanto, there is a girl on this same patch of grass that will trade you a Aerodactyl. 
for your Chansey. Aerodactyl, one of the fastest, most OP, insane Pokemon of Generation 2. Here, Prime for the taking. I gotta add, for me, this was always such a bittersweet thing because while it's so good, there was just never a point to use it in the post game where everything is so weak. In this case, however, it's going to save our game. Like, Aerodactyl is amazing on its own, but because it was traded to us, it gets a boosted XP bonus, making it literally perfect. With access to all the trainers on these routes, I'm able to do some quick grinding, and we managed to get Aerodactyl to level 39. And, uh, you want to know what happened? Aerodactyl swept it. Couple levels lower, does not matter. Give my man wing attack, he is fast. And I'm not just talking like, oh, it's pretty fast. No. This thing is tied for second fastest Pokemon in the game. So yeah, Aerodactyl is really good. <laughs> anyway, with Gym 4 done, up next is Janine, Koga's daughter, and her team is trash. Unlike every other leader here, she has Pokemon raging as high as 36. Um, so anyway, we, 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 we beat her. Now, few easy gyms out of the way. Next up was Sabrina, and this is where things do start to get a little more serious for us. We already saw how threatening Alakazam was, and being a few levels higher than me, this was going to be a real fight. But since Aerodactyl is fast and its high attack is an answer for Alakazam's low defense, it was really gonna be the only answer. Going into the fight, I figured it would be able to take one hit, but barely, and so my goal was to have her other three Pokemon take out her Espeon and Mr. Mime. That way Aerodactyl could go in and harm to seal the deal. Her first two Pokemon go down with a minor struggle, but the plan does go as hoped. And fortunately for us, despite the level difference, I do outspeed. And as I hit the ancient power, fishing for an Omni boost, I actually get it. I don't think this would have mattered as she just went for a reflect anyway, but it's kind of funny and I'm just happy that we can get this fight done with. So up next is the fire type leader Blaine, and this is always a sad fight. As a fire type user, he's easy in every game, and it's only made more sad in this generation since his gym has disappeared. But with type advantage, Blaine goes down super easy, and now we are on to a true threat. I would put Blue at a tie for hardest trainer in this game. While his team is higher leveled than Lance, I think it's hard to argue against three pseudo legendaries. So putting these guys at the same difficulty, we've got a pretty serious fight on our hands. Now at this point, I was also thinking of what I wanted for my final team to be going into the Elite Four, and I actually went out and caught a Mr. Mime. Technically, this is the same route as where we caught the Tentacool, but seeing as the other water routes we hadn't caught anything yet, I figured we'd be fine to just move Tentacool over there. And while not an insane attacker, Mr. Mime is a Pokemon that was going to provide us a lot of unique utility through the rest of the game. Starting with this blue fight, actually. So he starts with Pidgeotto, and I lead with Tentacruel to set off a Rain Dance. And with the power of water, moves being doubled, Pidgeot goes down in two shots. Next up comes Alakazam, which is his biggest threat, but also his lowest leveled Pokemon. So I swap to good old reliable Sentra to take a Psychic, and then we get a free switch in on Mr. Mime. This will be the first, but certainly not the last time that Mr. Mime comes in as very useful. Not being able to one-shot, his Alakazam goes for Reflect, and I actually hit an Encore. So Alakazam is now locked into using Reflect for two to five more turns. And the greatest thing about this is it doesn't even renew the turn length on Reflect. It simply just fails whenever it uses it again. So from here, I hit a Light Screen, swap into Aerodactyl, and 3-shot the Alakazam with Ancient Power. Now, from here, he goes Rhydon, and with a Rock Slide inbound, I'm feeling very nervous. I decide to swap into Venusaur, actually expecting to die, but I tank it really well. Venusaur also manages to outspeed the Rhydon, 17 levels higher than it, regain full health, and take it out in one shot. Let's go. From here, he goes Arcanine. I go into Aerodactyl to outspeed with Ancient Hour, but he hits Roar into Tentacruel, which is actually perfect. Tentacruel is bulky enough to hang on and survive an extreme speed, and I take it out with Surf. So Gyarados comes out next, and because it sees a kill with multiple moves, it's going to pick one randomly. We get incredibly lucky, though, and it goes with Hyper Beam. This is amazing because it means next turn he will have to recharge. From here, Aerodactyl comes out, Ancient Power does over half, he recharges, and it goes down without getting any damage on us. Now, Exeggutor comes out next, and I'm thinking, okay, this fight is in the bag. This is one of the most weakness-ridden Pokemon in all of the franchise. Like, this should be easy, right? No, actually, because he goes with the full restore. So I hadn't seen an AI heal in Kanto this entire run, and I had actually thought that it was just not on the table for them. I was 
so devastated because I thought I played this fight like perfectly. And I don't know, at this point, a, a spark just welled up inside me and I got mad and I said, screw it, I'm going offensive. So I swapped to Venusaur and I hit the sleep. From here, I swap back into Dugtrio and start sand attacking him. He sees a kill with Solar Beam, so keeps trying as I slowly whittle him down with Slash. And in this absolute rage, it actually manages to work. So looking back, I don't think this was the play, but I was just so frustrated I went for it. And anyway, in the end, we got really lucky beating Blue on our first try. So with all eight gym badges collected, it's now time for the Elite Four. And as a whole, I was feeling pretty good. But there's one giant issue my team was still facing. I don't have an answer for Lance. Like, yes, level-wise, much lower than Blue shouldn't be that hard. And despite having Aerodactyl with access to rocks, I just knew it wasn't going to be able to take out the entire team. So fortunately, though, after piecing together some ideas, I was able to come up with something that not only is going to work, but will make for really good content. The only thing I needed in this strategy was to level Mr. Mime up to 41. And to my absolute amazement, I realized at this point in the game, we've actually reached a trade that is infinitely playable. Introducing to you Cal of the Trainer House. You can come back and fight this guy every day and he gives you really good XP. Now, I realize that this is super abusable. So I set out with the intent to only get Mr. Mime to 41 and no one else going up any higher. So we spent a bit of time grinding in the Trainer House until Mr. Mime learned the move Baton Pass. From here, we head west to Victory Road with uh, all eight of our gym badges and now it's Victory Road time. I'm walking through here feeling great, I find Earthquake, and I think, hey, you know, this is so amazing. There's not a traitor in sight. What a beautiful victory road. And then all of a sudden, as I'm feet from the door, who shows up but that dude with the red hair? Yeah, I'm talking that guy, my sword nemesis. And can you believe this? He challenges me to a fight again. And so as promised from the start, I beat this dude deeper into the ground than a dig trio knows to dig. With that, it was time for the Elite Four. Well, actually not quite, because I only have five Pokemon, and I thought about adding something else to our team. Could have gone with any sort of level 40 Super Rod Pokemon, like Gyarados or Quagsider, and that would have been really nice. I also could have taken a Victory Road Pokemon, and I definitely know you guys are gonna hate me for not grabbing the Snorlax, but listen here. I was going into this with a strong team and a very good strategy for Lance. And our little squirrely boy Centret has been on the team from the start, taking shots to the dome for everyone else to get those nice setups. Could I really not send this beautiful boy to the Hall of Fame? I sure thought he'd earned it. So with that, I decided to keep our furry friend on the team and I entered Will's room. I led with Mr. Mime and go for a light screen to start off. From here, I hit an encore to keep him coming and I swap into Aerodactyl. From here, it was Aerodactyl in time and I basically just attacked him until he died. Very easy fight, one down, four to go. Coco's up next and this time I lead Aerodactyl. Aerodactyl goes down super easy, but his fortress is tough and takes four hits to go down, but fortunately it did not go for an explosion. Now knowing Psychic, I let Mr. Mime take care of Muck and his Crobat as he is helpless to do anything but try avoid strategies. Like father, like daughter, Koga is not very good. As an even easier fight than Wilt, that puts us at two down and three to go. Now since the only part of my Lance strategy I'm worried about revolves around the success of Mr. Mime, I decided to lead with him to get him a little more XP. And uh, Mr. Mime actually pulls a sweep. I believe the Machamp was a range, so yeah, and unsurprisingly, easy third win. Now at number four, we have Karen. And in my opinion, this is the only cool Elite Four member. She's smart and leads with the new dark type Umbreon, unlike Will, who just didn't get an Espeon. Anyway, since this thing could be really annoying, I go Venusaur, but it does what it does best and is really annoying. I miss seven times in a row, but I finally land a leech seed. From here with leftovers on my big boy though, it's only a matter of time before it succumbs to the sore. Next, Tentacruel tanks a hit from Houndoom before laying it out with Surf. And seeing as my man hadn't had any screen time yet, I wanted to give General the spotlight. And so I just sent him on a suicide mission against Vileplume. So he tanks the first pedal dance from Vileplume to land an earthquake before going down, except, oh wait, what is that? The focus band activates and he holds on with one one HP. He's paralyzed, but Vileplume gets fatigued, hits itself in confusion, and the myth 
Man and Legend General is able to get off an earthquake to take it down. It's a massive dub, cementing himself as the top military leader of the region. And from here, Aerodactyl comes in and kills the rest of her team. So now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Lance, and you get to witness my own personal greatest Gen 2 strategy of all time. Remember that bitter berry I used back on Misty? Well, berries reset every day, so I actually grabbed one before we went in. And you may also recall a certain Berserk gene I picked up in a similar area. For those that don't know, the Berserk gene is an item that raises your Pokemon's attack by two stages on entry. It's consumed after use, so you only get one shot with it, and it gives your Pokemon confusion for the following 256 turns. Generally, the confusion is not a worthwhile trade-off, so it's not something that anyone is ever apt to use in a Gen 2 playthrough. But since we started our game in Kanto, well, I actually found a chance for it to shine. So Lance leads Aerodactyl, I go with Mr. Mime, and the Berserk Gene instantly activates. You're thinking, Patrick, what's the point of giving a two-stage boost to a special attacker, the likes of Mr. Mime? Well, you see, it's the Baton Pass option, of course. So since it's confused, in this game, Mr. Mime has a 50% chance to hit the Baton Pass, and this is relatively crucial. Fortunately, we managed to hit it in the first attempt, and Aerodactyl comes in with all the stat changes on the field, including Confusion. Amazingly, Gyarados doesn't even Hyper Beam, but instead Rain Dances. And since Aerodactyl is holding a Bitter Berry, that instantly clears up its Confusion. Now, you remember how I said Aerodactyl is, like, fast? Well, let's just take a peek at Lance's team. He doesn't have a Mewtwo, Jolteon, Crobat, or an Electro. He certainly doesn't have a Deoxys or a Ninjask, so the only thing we need to worry about is Aerodactyl. But Aerodactyl, of course, has been EV trained, so let's see how this goes. Our Aerodactyl, the fastest Pokemon in play, has now been given a free plus two attack on entry and has six ancient powers, ready for each of Bird Keeper Lance's flyers. As Gyarados falls, he begins to send them out one by one. But not even Lance's mightiest of dragons can withstand the power of rocks, and they continue to fall. Not even Aerodactyl is a match for us, and as the chaos is raiding, our Aerodactyl actually learns Hyper Beam. Now, although I had planned to kill all six of his Pokemon with Ancient Power, the opportunity is just too good. I decide for once to give Lance a taste of his own medicine and finish his final Pokemon off with an Aerodactyl Hyper Beam. And you know, guys, I thought that was it. The battle ends, the camera storm in, we have just beaten our Kanto side quest. Professor Oak congratulates me. I'm put into the Hall of Fame and the credits roll. But then, something weird happens. My game resets. I hit continue, and the game takes me to a brand new region. Johto post-game? 